So here's what your ANOVA table will look like. It's going to have one, two, three, four, five columns. The first column is the source column, the second is degrees of freedom, sum of squares, mean sum of squares, or mean squares, and then the F value, the F test statistic. Sometimes you'll see an additional column, the P value column. If you're using software, that's very easy to do. If you're using just tables, you're limited in how you can do the P value. You can only get ranges approximately. Um, but with the uh, basic problems without software, you should have at least these five columns. All right, so let's talk about what goes in the source column. Remember, this is ANOVA, in other words, analysis of variance. So what we're talking about here is, you know, when you're doing this ANOVA procedure, is to think about what is the source of the variance, and that is what causes differences or variation in the data. And so in this model, it's very simple. We're going to say that there are treatments, and there is error. So in this case, our treatments are our fertilizer, right? And the error is just everything else that could affect the height of the orchids, like the water, the temperature, the air quality, you know, the lighting, everything else soil characteristics, all those things will affect how the orchids grow, but we've decided to put everything that is not a fertilizer into the air. So remember here, treatments in our case is fertilizer. You'll sometimes also see this as between versus within. They write that too in a lot of computer programs, between versus within. So remember, you could write that as well at the top here. You could say between and within, right? And then, of course, remember, this is also a fertilizer column for us, right? And our problem is the fertilizer. So there's a lot of different ways to label these two things. This bottom one is always called the total, right? Now, from there, we're going to have the degrees of freedom for these items. So let's fill those things in. So we're going to fill in all the details for our problem. All right, now, in our case, the degrees of freedom for the treatments is just the number of treatments, right, which is K, minus 1. So the number of treatments minus 1 here would be 2. There are three fertilizers, take away one, you get two. Then we have the error degrees of freedom. We're gonna do that in a moment. Let's get the total degrees of freedom first. It's gonna make it easier to find the error degrees of freedom. The total degrees of freedom is basically the number of experimental units, in this case, the number of orchid plants that have been tested, right? Minus one. So how many different values do we have? Minus one. Well, there are 15 values in this table. You take away one, you get 14. Now this and this must add up to 14, so clearly the answer here is 12. If you want to know the formula for this, it's actually the uh, total number of experimental units, which in this case is 15, minus the number of treatments, which is 3. 15 minus 3 will give you that same 12. However, that's harder to remember than just these two ones, which are more straightforward. If you subtract 1 from each of those, you get those values. And then the sum of these two things here must add up to the total. And so you can figure out by subtraction that this number is 12. All right, either way you do it, it's fine. It doesn't matter. Now, from there, the sum of squares value are going to come from the calculations that we did a moment ago. So let's go ahead and get those calculations back up so we can look at them. If you look at the ones that we did for treatments, the sum of square for treatment was 0.576. SST was 0.576. Then if you look at the one for error, the error we worked out to be SSE 0 0.18. So 0 0.18. Now the total sum of squares we actually worked out earlier, and that total sum of squares was given to us as 0.756. So 0 0.756. Okay, so now you have your column filled in for sum of squares. To finish it up, we're going to now complete the rest of the table right here on the table. We're going to get the mean squares by simply dividing straight across in each row here. We don't need to worry about it for total, so we're really going to ignore this space here. Don't pay any attention to that space. So what we're going to do here is we're just going to do 2 into 0.576 to give us the mean square for treatments. So it's going to be, in this case, 0.576 divided in half, and we'll get the answer 0 0.288, so 0 0.288. We're gonna do the same here, going straight across 12 into 0 0.18, so 0 0.18 divided by 12. And this is gonna give us 0 0.015.
All right, and then from there, we're finally going to take those two values, divide them into one another. So this time we're going from here into here to produce the number here, right? So this number into that number to give you the test statistic, and that will finish the problem for us finally. So we're going to have 0.288 divided by 0 0.015. And when we do that, we end up with the answer 19.2, which is a pretty large test statistic. That's our F test statistic for the problem. And so now we have officially completed both the data step, which is step three in hypothesis testing, and the test stat step, which is also step four, right? So our test stat here ends up being this value that's located in that cell, and that was our goal ultimately. We got the answer at 19.2. Okay, good, so now it's time to move on to the critical value step of the problem. Okay, so from the ANOVA table, what we see is that the test stat is equal to, and we saw it was pretty large, it was 19.2, right? That's what we found in the last step of our ANOVA table, that the test stat, the F value is 19.2. Now from here, we have to compare it to the critical value, the critical value. So this is normally our step five, right? So we had step one, two, three, four, and five. Okay, so for the critical value, we're going to have to basically look up an F critical value, right? We're going to compare an F test stat to an F critical value. We're going to need an F value from our table. And we're going to have numerator degrees of freedom, denominator degrees of freedom. So we're going to need to worry about that, right? So numerator degrees of freedom. Then we have denominator degrees of freedom. And then we have, of course, alpha. So let's try to figure out what these values are in our problem. Well, talking about numerator and denominator, let's go back to look at our NOVA table just for a moment here and see what we saw there. When we did our calculation here, we did a division problem for our test stat. We did this piece divided by this piece, right? So this number, the MST divided by the MSE, right? MST divided by MSE. When we did that then, we're going to take the degrees of freedom then as the numerator to be the top number's degrees of freedom, which will be 2. And the denominator degrees of freedom is going to be the bottom number, which is 12. So this kind of looks like a fraction to remind us numerator denominator, right? So 2, 12 is what we need for this position here. So it's going to be F, numerator degrees of freedom 2, denominator degrees of freedom 12. And then back in the problem, we can see the alpha was 1% or 0 0.01. All right, now that we have that settled, now we know what we need to look up at the table. So we're going to go to our F table, and we're going to find these values, our critical values. Then we're going to place that number on our F curve. Remember, our F curve kind of looks like a very skewed bell curve shape, right? So something like that, let's say, starting at zero. And we'll shade this right over to the right. We're looking for this critical value located right here, right? The alpha here being 0 0.01. So our critical value is the value that lands here. And we're going to compare that against our test stat to see where it lands. All right, let's go to our table and figure out our F critical value now. Okay, so we're looking up 2, comma 12 on the 0.01 table. And when we isolate the 12 row and look in the 2 column, we find the answer is 6.93. So our degrees of freedom um, of 2 for the numerator, 12 for the denominator produces a critical value on the 0.01 table of 6.93. So our critical value from the table is 6.93. If we compare this F test stat to it, I'm going to say that clearly the test stat of 19.2 lands well in the tail area, which means we are going to decide that we should reject HO. And if we reject HO, remember that means we should support HA. Now, looking back at our claim and asking when we compare our claim to HO and HA, which one is the claim most similar to, it's clear the claim is most similar to HA, so we're going to say that we support, then, the claim. So we're going to write that kind of common classic phrase, the sample data, the sample data supports the claim.
Okay, good. So that's that's a perfectly legitimate uh, wording of the final conclusion that we've used a thousand times before. But what I want to do is talk about it in more practical terms because sometimes people write that statement and they get such in the habit of saying it, they don't really start to think about what it means. So what does it mean here? Well, this would say that what? It means that at least one of the fertilizers differs from the others. So what it means is that they're not all the same. That's what we're basically saying. Not all these fertilizers work the same. And by looking at the data itself and the way it turned out in the experiment, it seems that C was larger than B significantly. Why do I say that? Because it certainly has a higher total than B, right? And so we said there's the difference. They're not all the same. At least one pair of these can be found, but when you compare them, there's a significant difference between them. That's what we basically discovered. So if, there, if you can't say there's a significant difference between the largest and the smallest, then I don't think you could say there was a significant difference between the largest and the next largest, right? And so on and so forth. So that essentially would make sense to me then to say that it must be true that the smallest and the largest are significantly different. But what we don't know from this test, what we cannot tell from a completely randomized designed ANOVA test is this. I can't tell you if, for example, fertilizer A and fertilizer C are different. And I can't tell you if fertilizer A and fertilizer B are different. I can't say that. I mean, perhaps they're all different. Maybe C is significantly higher than A, which is significantly higher than B, right? Maybe they're all different. Or maybe C and A are a virtual tie, but B is smaller than both C and A. You know, those are the different type of scenarios that I can't answer from this problem. All I can say for sure is that there must be a difference between the largest and the smallest. Because if you couldn't show there's a difference between the largest and the smallest, then you can't show there's a difference between any of them, right? So at least I know that B and C work differently and C seems to work better. But what if C was really expensive, like four times as expensive as A? If I could show that A and C work basically the same, like in other words, they're not significantly different from one another, that this difference is just kind of random error, that it's not a true significant difference between the two, then of course I would rather as a farmer, for example, or somebody who grows orchids, a flower producer, I wouldn't want to buy C, I'd rather buy A, right? If A is four times cheaper and it works statistically speaking the same as C, then I'm going to go with A, right? You know, if they're the same price, then maybe on the safe side I'd go with C because perhaps C is bigger. But the point is, is that if I don't know and C is very expensive, I really would like to get at the question eventually this, which is this. I'd like to know, gee, is A significantly different from C? To answer that, we're going to have to look at the next section, the section where we talk about uh, making multiple comparisons. So the ANOVA test can only say that, hey, one of these means at least differs from the others, or at least one of them, right? So we could maybe say for sure that C and B are different from the ANOVA test, but we don't know if C and A are different, we don't know if A and B are different. So to figure out those differences, we're going to have to use something called a multiple comparison procedure, and that's why those procedures exist, to help us know whether, for example, C and A are significantly different from each other. Okay, so that's it.